Hello, this is Father Lewis Skurdy with segment two of Climate Change Controversy. And my guest, once again, is Jerome Wagner. Welcome, hey, Jerome, Father. again. Yep. It's wonderful. Um, if you've heard and seen the first segment, you realize, wow, the information is going to blow your mind, as they say. Um, we're going to pick up with that. And I think it's very important always to realize that we as Christians have an obligation to take care of the earth. And our Pope, uh, Francis, has made that very clear in Laudato Se, which we will re refer to here and there. Okay, um, you made it your mission to be an activist. What has that done for you, and what does that look like? Okay, thank you. Uh, so at the earliest points back in 2009, 2010, it meant... Uh, do doing reading, um, you know, sort of processing things on a personal level. Uh, I did something, well, I started up a website, which is not really in use any longer, but it challenged me to do things I had never done, like maybe create a more public face for myself on the issue of climate change, um, but also do reading and be able to digest and that kind of thing. Now, uh, pretty shortly after that time, I'm moved from Endicott, which I where I'd lived for 30 years, back to Wayne, New Jersey, back to northern New Jersey. So um, at that point, uh, I became involved with the Franciscan response to fracking, which still is operating out of uh, St. Mary's Church in Pompton Lakes. Um, so I did some work with them, but that involved a variety of things, writing letters to local legislators, going to Trenton for rallies and other mm -hmm. lobbying, um, writing letters to the editor, um, following local projects of interest, uh, you know, pipelines or whatever, learning about fracking and other practices that are, that I feel are detrimental uh, to the environment or relative to in climate change. So I was challenged to be involved in those kinds of actions. And, and you list these very quickly any one of them could be a, a life experience. Any one of them could be any person's or group of people's uh, focus. And you've been participating in letters and, and, and protests and lobbying. Interesting. Right. Right. Give, us, give us what one of those experiences was, was like. Want to go to a lobby or you want to go to a protest? Well, no. I'm going to change the subject. <clears throat> right. So pretty early in, well, in 2011, I went to a conference principally of young people in Washington, D.C. It was called Power Shift. Um, people like Al there were 10,000 young people assembled along with old people like me um, in, in, in Washington for that event. Al Gore spoke there, Van Jones spoke there, Bill McKibben, and those are all, I'll say, heroes of the climate movement. Now, at the end of the conference, a number of us decided to do an arrestable action in the Department of the Interior, in their lobby. We sat down and chose not to leave and were subsequently arrested and so forth. So that was my first arrest situation for climate. It was the first deliberate arrest of any type for me up to that point. And so, what year was that? 2011. Okay. So, uh, but that was interesting. I met some people that were, that actually lived up here in Northern New Jersey and I still work with some of them routinely. You know, so that was, so that was, so you get to see things from a different perspective yeah. when you go out on a limb like that. Okay, what were you uh, sitting in for? What was, what was being objected? At the, my recollection uh, was that it had to do with the leasing of public lands for extraction of fossil fuels, whether it was probably natural gas at the time, although I don't recall with any specificity. And that kind of issue is still pervasive. There is still, that, those kind of sales are still occurring. Um, the the use of public lands to extract fossil fuels with, you know, r relatively low turn back or, you know, payback to society, to America, you know, basically saying profiteering, you know, that is still occurring. Mm. But, uh, so I believe that was the issue at the time. Wow. And any success come out of that? <laughs> uh, it's, I'll comment that in an activist life, the moments of success are pretty few and very, and pretty fleeting. And sometimes, so I don't recall, I'll, I'll point to another specific action by another individual. Another individual interrupted an auction, but well, he actually bid on parcels of land that he did not intend to drill. He went to jail for almost two years, um, but he did stop the development of that acreage for fossil fuel extraction. So those kind of successes do happen, 
but they're relatively they're, they're relatively few. Mm. The, the the inertia both in society and business to simply continue extracting fossil fuels is enormous. Okay, explain that. Explain extracting fossil fu fuels from the environment. Sure. Uh, some of the Barbara Stomber may have related to this in earlier segments, talking about fracking. Frac I mean, in the past, we've been able to drill into, you know, through the earth into deposits of, say, natural gas that were fairly large. So if you if you put your drill down at the right place, you would punch into that, you know, can of stuff, right. and it would all just come out. So that was, but now because you know, uh, we're using processes like hydraulic fraction, which are much more technically intensive, but also use toxic chemicals in their process. Um, so that's one example of extraction. And we would call that extreme extraction. Another example is blowing off the tops of mountains in, in West Virginia and so forth, and a practice is called mountaintop removal. And again, that, that's done pervasively. If you can see those kind of effects on satellite imaging, they continue to happen. Um, drilling in deep water area, deep oceanic areas, uh, in, with the deep water horizon back in 2010, I guess it was, you know, again, we're drilling sometimes miles down through water, then through another mile of, you know, geological strata to get to reserves. That also is extreme extraction. And then I, I would say that any discussion of drilling in, Antart in Arctic areas is also extreme extraction, is extraction. So that's a, a sense of um, what extraction means. So the, the pro, the, the, um, pro extractors, what would they say is is going on when we're extracting that deeply into the into the Earth's uh, crust, you might say. Okay, well, I think that they would justify their action by saying that society can continue to enjoy all of its current benefits un, unabated. You know, if we like having our, you know, rooms nice and warm or in the winter and cool in the summer, and we like driving our cars, even if they're hybrids, if we like that, then we ought to be happy and applauding them that they're continuing to extract wherever it's possible. So I, I would, I think they'd also say, well, we're using technology to wring out every every ounce of fossil fuels that we can from this mother earth. You know, we're just going to continue to wring it out. And what's wrong with that? I think I think that I think that's wrong in a number of perspectives. I think that it, first of all, e extractive economies do not properly respect the people from those areas, whether it's on indigenous lands or in other countries. So I think there are human right, human right issues. I think that it also is continuing practices that we know are insane. At this time, I would say it's insane to be building more pipelines for fossil fuels and drilling more wells for fossil fuels because we know it's going to kill us. Mm. So I, I think it's an, it's an addict, it's the, it's the actions of an addict that are completely irrational. And, and once again, referring to Pope Francis, he focuses on the poor and how they are the first to suffer when the land is, is dissipated, when the land is destroyed, they're the first to suffer. And of course, those who are making money on it can't look at that. Exactly. Right. So that's why this is a very Christian and very um, God-centered topic. It's, it's so important. You know, you think about the earth and the environment, and that has nothing to do with God in so many ways, we think. But the first book of the scriptures, the Genesis, is creation. And, and I think... Those books of creation t certainly teach us respect and love and, and our uh, stewardship of creation. I agree. So this brought you, among other, uh, other uh, in, uh, experiences, to Paris. How did that invitation come through to you to attend the Paris Summit? Uh, all right, well, I wish it was because the um, United States government saw my intelligence and wisdom and wit and decided to, you know, pay for my trip, but that is not the case. Okay, I did not have a formal position at the uh, Paris conference. The people doing this kind of work are skilled, seasoned, educated, ne educated negotiators who've been doing this kind of thing for years. So people like me have no business at the table. But, you know, the, 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 all of these conferences also allow for public participation. So there was the official conference area, there was the big NGO space, 
and there was the public. I was in the public. Okay. Meeting. So okay. They, they, they admitted anybody who wanted to go. So that was easy. How but, many people? Uh, uh, numbers. Uh, Hundreds, thousands? N- n- well, thousands. Yeah. But not many. Um, but I also have family in France, so I took advantage to visit my... So go, going there had a number of ulterior motives, but... Um, so I visited also a daughter who lives in France. I visited family while I was there. I got to speak French again and eat croissants. Oh, you know, great. So, uh, but then I also went to the conference and observed, and I did some protesting there as well. So, uh, so that, it was fun. The results of the conference, you weren't satisfied with. True. Now, what's called the Paris Agreement did come out of, of that conference after many years of negotiation. And granted... A hundred, almost two th- 200 countries uh, or political entities agreed to, signed on to the Paris Agreement, and it has taken force as of now. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I say, as I mentioned in the first, in another segment, um, the goal should have been to get to less than two degrees, and the plans that were offered did not reach two degrees. Rather, they they would have allowed for up to 2.7 or 3.5 degrees centigrade of temperature increase, which again is, it's astronomical and it's unacceptable. So, from plus the the commit the people nations did not even make commitments; they made contributions. Mm-hmm. They made you know national independent nationally determined contributions. There's no enforceability. It doesn't meet the criteria or the goals that they should have met. And there are no enforcement mechanisms. So in a lot of ways, it's, uh, well, it's poor. It's unacce- it's mm-hmm. unacceptable. Mm-hmm. It happened, so that's positive. The results are unacceptable. True. Because it's they still not enough. Far, they don't, far they enough. don't dig yes. far enough. Right, right, right. What's the next stage of, of this whole experience, nationally and internationally. Well, the next stage is going to be the incoming administration, which by the time this airs, it'll be the administration we're uh, residing under. Um, uh, the, I'll just name names. Trump, President Trump has uh, campaigned on issues like starting up the coal mining industry again in force, um, uh, disregarding the Paris Agreement on climate um, and other things like that. And he's also promoting former CEOs of major oil companies for major positions in his administration. So the out, the prospect is that uh, things are going to become a lot more contentious and stressful for people like myself um, in the coming years. And that is that's a very sad uh, state. So typically, you know, it would have been people like me continuing to educate the public, get more people on board with conservation and transitioning to renewable energy, which would have been hard, which is already hard enough. Mm -hmm, But mm -hmm. the prospect of having to um, politically, you know, to intervene in a political process and a financial process that that is doesn't care about us or doesn't really want to hear what we have to say is daunting beyond comparison, beyond compare. That's a sad note to end on, but we're going to because that's the reality of the situation. We'll pick up other aspects of your your um, focus in, in subsequent segments. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Wow, thank you've you, Father. Sadden us and opened our <laughs> yeah. eyes and uh, challenge us as well. Great. This has been Father Louis Skirty. Uh, Jerome, I'm going to ask you, to, why don't you give you, the audience your email if they want to contact you? Sure. All right. So my personal email is jj. Wagner, W-A-G-N-E-R, zero, zero, at gmail.com. And I'm also involved with what a group called 350 New Jersey. So you could get me also at info, I-N-F-O, at 350nj.org. Thank you. This has been Father Louis Skirty, and you contact me at fatherlouisskirty at hotmail.com. Let me hear from you. Give me some reactions and get involved. God bless you.